Now we're going to have a panel. It's going to be about 40 minutes. I've got a handful of questions to kick us off, but we're really looking to you to raise your questions. They're going to be better than mine. Um, that's for sure, because my first question is, um, it's a tradition whenever I host a panel just to ask everyone what's the coolest thing you've seen this year because I find that it's great to bring people to life. I know who you are as a human as well as a professional. So we'll pass it maybe, are you ready at that end? The coolest, non-coolest thing is Trump being elected, unfortunately. <laughs> oh yeah, the only rule is you're not allowed to say your children. You can have that. <laughs> uh, the coolest thing that I see is uh, there's a, a medical company which is developing, which is using VR to be able to help people who are homebound to connect to their doctors they can see everything about them um, and I think that's actually really interesting right? yeah. Um, I've actually seen two things uh, this year, one of which was very disappointing and that was on a, a crowdfunding website and it was a, a type of lightsaber uh, sh a razor and it looked incredible, I thought it was amazing, they said you won't need you know, shaving foam or anything, I thought I might chuck a tenny into this and then right at the bottom I saw the picture was an artist's impression, I thought right, okay. Uh, the other genuinely... Hold on, hold on. You don't shave. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say I was going to use it. Oh, okay. <laughs> right, <sorry. laughs> um, the other actual uh, slightly geeky, cool thing I've, I've, I've seen, I met with a, a company called Coin Firm uh, earlier this week, and they do due diligence for Bitcoin. So one of the big issues of Bitcoin is the fact it's so anonymous, you can't care due diligence, you don't know who the people are, the source of funds and that sort of thing. Whilst they, at this point, can't positively identify the person behind the account, because of the, the, the public, uh, public access to the ledger, they're able to see with whom that account is associated with, whether they've taken payments or made payments to other accounts. And again, because of the, the nature of the public information, they know which accounts are associated with terrorism, with drugs, with you know, all, the, you know, all the wonderful things. Um, very interesting. Uh, to, towards, the, towards the end of next year, they're going to be in a position where they can not only carry out due diligence on a Bitcoin account insofar as who they've interacted with, but they'll also be able to positively identify the person behind the account. But they're still working on that part of it. Okay, in the spirit of being a privacy lawyer and not entirely buying into the techtopia sort of environment, I'm just going to actually give an uncool example of the use of technology. So the uncoolest thing that I've seen in the last few weeks, and, and, and this is the setting up of a new system or database in China, um, which I think you might have heard about, you know, to the one which is basically building a, a credit reference system, system, but based on your social credit, what kind of person you are looking even th at things like your buying habits or you know what video games that you're playing and this is going to be a China-wide system and it'll be used for all sorts of things. I hear one of the uses is for dating sites so you know if you want to go out with someone you can check their social credit and you can see you know whether if they're a video gamer they're going to be way down there. <laughs> Actually it doesn't sound too bad does it? I mean it would would help you cut through your Tinder swipes a bit quicker I think if we had that here but who knows. So this is a throwback. Uh, this is it was an app. So I was with some friends and I showed them Happy Cow, <laughs> right? Because I'm a vegetarian. Happy Cow is a wonderful app because it will locate based it will locate vegetarian or vegetarian option restaurants uh, within your location. Very Three. simple, really nice app. The I showed <laughs> him really, like adult, a tech but. geek, and he had like he he had like three minute engagement <laughs> on that thing, which is you know what that means. <laughs> um, so mine's probably not cool unless it links to Alpesh but uh, from a slightly geeky perspective uh, the fact that a nation state interfered with a first world world, uh, world election i.e. Russia hacking uh, the election this year I think <laughs> from allegedly. A date, allegedly yeah sorry <laughs> allegedly virtually positively um, I think it's got massive repercussions uh, globally going forward around elections, anything like that, and data privacy as well, massive impact. That's awesome, from the sublime to the ridiculous. Thank you very much, that's really a good start. So, next step, as usual, um, we should just nail down a definition. Uh, the risk in these panels is we go round and round in circles because we haven't really locked down what compliance is. Um, for me, to be honest, compliance is kind of the safe sex campaign of the financial services industry. <laughs> um, but I wonder if our 
experts we've assembled here can, can, can agree, because I, what I get a sense of is there's a common pool of what compliance is, <laughs> but then there are tribes within it with everyone with different perspectives. So um, this is going to be a little interesting. So I think what we're going to do is go in a Wikipedia rewriting style and pass it back down the line. You mentioned at the beginning, Rob, that you're keen, you, you want to rebrand compliance. You want to move away to another word. So this is your chance to, if you could define in Wikipedia what it said under compliance, how would you start? And as we pass this Chinese whispers down the line and it evolves, hopefully we're going to get something that everyone's fed into and everyone's comfortable with to describe, in its broadest sense, compliance. Sure. No, great. Um, Really, I think I think compliance has probably got two aspects to it. It's the, the, the legalistic regulatory, you must comply with X, Y, and Z. But there's then the, uh, I think I mentioned when I was talking, the operational component of that. And I think that's the challenge, right, with, from a compliance perspective. So um, uh, certainly in a financial crime sense, it, it can be really dangerous just to follow the regulatory tick box comp compliance dictionary version. Um, and I think actually you end up missing a lot of the spirit of what's meant to be done. So I know I'm not redefining it here, but I think I think that's the challenge. Compliance now covers so many different facets. It's like FinTech, right? It, it covers what, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, payments, all sorts of different stuff. And I think that's exactly the same with compliance. It's such a broad definition. Um, so I think from my perspective, from a financial crime perspective, I would certainly like to see people talking more about risk management than just compliance. Um, and I think that will take the industry forward rather than sticking in the dark ages. Cool. A reminder, if you're going to fit that on Twitter while you're sitting here, I should remind you the hashtag, hashtag, uh, we are fintech. Yeah. Hashtag, we are fintech. We might bring in a Twitter rule here where we're, we're looking for a nutshell. And you can choose <laughs> to adopt what you've had previously or you can throw that over your shoulder and start again with your preferred definition. You know, I mean, back to what I'd mentioned before, I think you, uh, it's the, uh, I think, if your client would be shocked by what you do if they found out you're not in compliance. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Pass it on. Yeah, and I think, um, my, uh, not entirely redefining compliance, but I think you should be responsible for your own compliance. You gave the safe sex analogy. I think don't rely on the withdrawal method. Don't bury your head in the sand. <laughs> you know, look for, look for expert advice where you need it. A lot of it's free out there in the privacy world because the regulators are very good and they publish a lot of stuff. Um, but take responsibility. C compliance shouldn't be an add-on. It should just be, you should, we should, there shouldn't even be a compliance word. It's just what you do when you build a business. You do it the right way, you take the right advice, you get things right. Um, yeah, a lot of pressure here because I'm actually a compliance consultant. So <laughs> if I don't come out with a good answer. Um, I, I think compliance very often focuses very much on, 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 on the rules and, you know, the words and, exactly how to interpret the rules. I think the FCA is, is, is moving in the right direction so far that they're concerning themselves at the moment a bit more with the outcomes. So not just have you followed the line of the rule, but have, have you achieved what that rule is, is, is set out to try and achieve for clients? You know, for example, you've got treating customers fairly. They may not specifically care how you deal with the clients as long as the outcome is that that client is treated fairly. Um, I like to look at more high-level uh, definition of compliance. It's just ensuring that, that, that your business delivers what it should do and, and protects the consumers, essentially. Um, I would agree with that. I would say it's more of a relationship, though, um, because it's an ongoing relationship that needs to be maintained between the regulator, the client, and also the company. And I don't think it's something that you just do the once and that's it. It's a tick box exercise. I think it's something that is progressive and goes on for as long as you run the business in that industry. Um, I mean, for me, it's pretty straightforward. If you want to be, if you want to protect your clients, you want to protect yourself as a business and you want to be in business, then compliance should be part of what you do and not be afraid of it. Um, you know, meet it head on and make sure that you 
actually make it efficient for yourself <laughs> to be compliant, because that's one of the things for me. If you don't make it efficient, like a bank that I can tell you about that has 25,000 people doing AM or KYC, <laughs> that costs them billions, you know? <laughs> so for me, I, I, it's making sure that you're protecting every part of the value chain. You're protecting your investors, you're protecting the, you know, the customer on this side, you're protecting yourself as a company um, so that you can grow. I mean, ultimately, it's about making sure that you can have a business in the future that doesn't get shut down. Um, and obviously, think about Africa. For me, it's it's for me. It, you could just say it's free fall or do whatever you want, but actually, that's not going to help long term. Long term, if you if you abuse that, the fact that there's a lack of regulation, if, if you abuse it, eventually it will come back and bite you in the backside. You know. So, so for me, it's about embracing it. I've got it down to six words based on not quite one word from each person. If I could try that out and then... Perhaps I could actually offer something because uh, uh, myself, I come from a purely technological background. Uh, my last years were in quality assurance. And in fact, what strikes me the most in this panel is that you guys are speaking strictly QA language. And I would say that if you would like to describe compliance as something slightly differently sounding, it would be the smoke testing of your business, uh, which is, I suppose the alliance is not known. Uh, smoke testing means that you check if your product does not literally explode in your face. <laughs> okay. And I, think I think you need a microphone much. for this. Because, uh, <laughs> yes. Can you hear at the back, or is this getting locked? Yeah. There you go. Uh, so just, uh, just a bit of uh, insight. Uh, <coughs> There is a lot of uh, overlap in philosophy and language between uh, what the guys here offer and how quality assurance operates. <coughs> and in my, in my impression, uh, the most similar uh, procedure, the most similar custom is the small testing, which is literally checking that your product does not explode in your face when you just try to first use it. And I think, I think this is pretty much <coughs> what compliance does to you. Okay. Nice. So we've got an offer from the audience here. Thank you. Um, I've, I've tried a definition. I've got six words here. Procedures to protect your business relationships. Does that? I think it goes beyond <laughs> procedures. <laughs> sorry. Gonna, sorry. Come on, we've got another from the audience. Can I make an observation? Go for um, it. Sorry. I was... Uh, I was picking up on something that Jeffrey and Gilbert said. Um, okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, I was picking up something which both Jeffrey and Gilbert said. Um, I used to be a head of legal for a big US brokerage house, but based in the UK. And what struck me was that compliance meant different things um, on different sides of the Atlantic. So my experience was that my US colleagues regarded compliance as a much more box-ticking exercise and were less interested in the principles behind it, whereas in the UK, <coughs> Gilbert certainly correctly intimated, um, the approach is very much more principles-based. It's about doing the right things because they're the right things to do. It's much more, and I'd like to be in, in the word ethics. I think it's a much more ethical process in the UK. And, and I get asked, I, I'm a lawyer now in a law firm and I advise in text, and I get asked to give them a, sort of legal advice in writing because they want, they want something to back them up in case they get investigated by the FCA. And for me, it's what I, one thing I say to them is you can't necessarily get the rules exactly right in the UK. It's about getting the principles right and about doing the right things. So, um, really, you, you, even if you can get, it's all about. It's like showing your homework when you when you're doing maths homework as a mm. kid. It's like showing your workings. If you reach the right, reach even what the essay thinks is the wrong conclusion for the right for reasons, you're probably okay in the UK, mm. but not in the US. <coughs> cool. Um, thanks. So I guess my challenge to the compliance world is. Uh, until you can describe it in one <coughs> sentence, it's really hard to communicate it. No one else has got long enough to get really what compliance is doing if you can't sum it up in a nutshell and maintain a common message about what it is. Um, so I think it's useful to develop this. At, at this point, I've tweaked it as far as ethical practices to protect your business relationships. Mm. Uh, and we'll park that and move on, I think, although there's a question here. I'm a father of three, and I think compliance, the way I see it, is just protecting your baby. So, as, as, <laughs> so when you have a kid, you don't want it to fall down the stairs, you put a barrier at the top of the stairs. If you want it to grow, you still give it a little bit of leeway, but you make sure you still put 
Take five big case so your baby is protected. That's awesome. Compliance is protecting your baby. New slogan for the industry. <laughs> um, perfect. So we'll, we'll move on from defining this. I think we're in a common enough area that we get what's going on. Um, I have so many different questions, but I'm going to limit it to one. We've got choices, which are what are the best other industries that compliance can learn from? Could be other countries. The other thing is other themes that are going to impact the most in the future, such as bots and open APIs. Um, or also, how do we preach to the unconverted? Or if you were the FCA, what is the one thing you would change? So does anyone want to shout out from any of those or their own? Would any of those stand out for you? How about the best and the worst? Yeah, best and worst industries. Best and worst. Best and worst industries by popular demand. Aerospace, best. <laughs> kills kills so few people. Cool. So worst healthcare kills the most people. <laughs> <laughs> Take it away. So best and worst industries that we can learn from for financial services <laughs> compliance. Well, yeah, just air, like I said, aerospace kills the few, fewest people, and it has the most use, right? And then healthcare has got to be the worst in compliance and killing people by mistake. Okay. Any other industries you want to add in? Yeah, so I would say that we have a lot of clients who are big, established, and successful technology firms. And I find, from a privacy perspective, I find them amongst the best in compliance because they have to be, and you know, the, the, it's really built in, and they, have, they actually have strong privacy teams, for example, and they do make sure that they, they get their products right because they have, you know, they have the money to do that for one part, but also because they've learned over the years that it's not worth cutting the corners. And then unfortunately, the worst that compliance tend to be the, the small technology firms, you know, where you know, it, it, it is difficult sometimes to find the money for the right compliance advice, the right legal advice. Um, and I think you there, you have to be guided, as, like I said, about by your responsibilities, your general ethical common sense approach. If it doesn't feel right, if you know in your heart that this isn't quite right or it's pushing too many boundaries, then you, that's when you need to go and seek legal advice and, and, and take responsibility for getting it right. Cool, so any other industries to look to? Can I just... Oh, oh go ahead. <laughs> um, I was gonna say the worst, possibly, is the food industry. Um, not food as a whole, food production, but packaged food industry, because I think there's so many things in there that we don't know about, and it does have an impact on our health. Okay, nice. Can I wait for uh, Maybe the legal system, because <laughs> that's all about compliance. I think we can hear you okay. Yeah, yeah I, I wanted to save you the journey. Mm. <laughs> so the legal system, uh, applying that is all about compliance. Yeah. What do you mean exactly? It's a good or well, bad. Well, the law is it, is it and, and how it's applied. <coughs> well, it's we, we as citizens mm -hmm. have to be compliant, and the police and the law enforcers have to uh, make us compliant. Do you think that ink is in? Sorry, this is this is a really good debate. Bring it up. <laughs> really, 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 please come up with this and be applied. Absolutely. Because as we know, the law never accomplishes justice, and perhaps that's what it should be about. Because at the heart of this issue, it's been interpreted as ethics. I wouldn't what's disagree. Right I wouldn't disagree wrong. with you on some of that. I mean, I've got a friend who's a criminal lawyer, and he'll tell me, "I've got a case coming up, and it depends which judge we get." Exactly. Yeah. And does he ever ask if the de defendant has? committed the crime. No, you can't. You can't do that. It's ethically, you cannot do that. Um, they, they, can, they can tell you. If, if you know, you can't have... Actually, there are very strict... Although the legal profession has something of a reputation, there are actually very, very strict regulations for what you can and can't do. Uh, and you can't act for somebody who you know is... You can't lie in court. So your, your first duty is always to the court and not to your client. Okay. But nonetheless, as an industry, I think it, it has its parallels with compliance. Well, I don't know. about rules. Yeah. So maybe that, that is the, the broadest, broadest industry. Cool. I'm going to keep a keen eye on how this conversation develops at the end of the panel session. One observation, really bad compliance, uh, broadband. Broadband <laughs> delivery. Oh, yes. Yeah. Terrible. 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 I think you did it Broadband <laughs> delivery, the worst. So you have comment? Um, there's a little street that's much worse than law. In principle is highly compliant with regulations and it's pharmaceuticals. But in practice, the, the way the pharmaceutical industry works is that there's a great deal of lying 
and deliberate lying in the reporting of laboratory results, so that in fact you've got a lot of uh, pharmaceutical products that are not really fit for purpose, or that have side effects that have not been reported properly. So you've got a, a problem of the, the official level of compliance, which is very, very high, but what's happening in practice is not so good. Now, coming back to the financial industry, uh, we have a great deal of regulation to be complied with to do with AML and fraud and so on and so forth. But I can tell you from personal experience that large banks, I'm not talking about small startups, I'm talking about three of the largest banks in this country, have managed to screw up their anti fraud processes so badly that I've actually been defaulted of, let's say, a large six figure amount of money. And I'm still trying to unwind all of what they've managed to cock up. And it's because they've been following the rules, not looking at the results, and at how the rules can be bent by essentially criminals. And the, com the compliance world is not taking account of this problem. The FCA is certainly not. Can, I, Max, can, can I we ask who the fourth bank was that hasn't been forwarded to you? Because presumably <laughs> they are a good example of us to follow. Um, Metro actually managed to stop anything going wrong. Metro haven't defrauded you? No. It's not the bank that defrauded me, it's the bank that didn't look at what was happening with the accounts right. and allowed the frauds to happen. But by the way, there are at least two... So they're innocent until proven guilty, but the others have gone down. My estimation. Back to the question, just to remember, we're looking at industries with good practices we can learn from, bad practices we can also learn from. I was just going to say, it, it, your example, unfortunate example there, is an absolute classic example of where a rules-based system has fundamental failures, right? Especially where, and I, I call them an adversary, but, but criminals are an adversary, <laughs> where they are constantly looking at ways of exploiting the rules in their own right. And uh, that is the challenge from a financial crime compliance perspective, but it also applies across other compliance factors where people can find a way around or pay for a very expensive lawyer to find a way around the compliance requirements. Um, and I think that is why, and I'm sorry to bang on it about it again, ultimately in the financial crime space it's got to come down to understanding the risks you're trying to deal with uh, and manage those risks effectively and keep up to date with those risks so that you can look forward and predict what they're going to do and that's where I think some of the other points we're going to discuss around AI and some of those things have an opportunity to to really drive the industry forward from a financial crime perspective but I think it's probably the same in other areas of compliance as well. So I'm not going to bring up uh, an example of industry because this actually spans several industries it's 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 an area of compliance. Um, I'm going to bring up health and safety because of what I would refer to as regulatory creep. So health and safety serves a very good purpose. However, you know, you get to a certain point where the people making the rules have to justify the existence. And, you know, I, I can't remember if it was just one of these ridiculous headlines from the sun, but I seem to remember in the back of my mind school children being banned from playing conkers, for example. You know, you, you can get what they're getting at, but come on. You know, so, so I'd be afraid of, you know, regulations, you know, oh, we've sorted this out, what can we do next? without really thinking about whether it's needed or reasonable. On that subject, are there any out-of-date compliance rules which should be trimmed that you... Let's say, okay, you wake up, you're in charge of the FCA, and you're going to trim some of those out-of-date rules. What's first on the hatchet? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 I fundamentally think that it's exceptionally difficult for a regulator to be constantly keeping pace with the, the rate of development in the industry, for example, from a financial services perspective. So look, I, I, I think they, they are doing their best, certainly in the UK, they're very open, etc. I think some of the, uh, some of the rules around AML, uh, CTF, sanctions compliance, um, I think they could be bought into the modern world. We touched on it earlier around onboarding of customers, non-face-to-face, -face, okay? I think that is, uh, probably going to be the norm in the next few years that virtually every bank will do that does that mean they need to be a high risk customer I think it depends on the underlying controls and, and what data you're gathering so I think there are some components of the regulation 
but I think the challenge for everyone, both in industry and regulators, is to build a regulatory framework that, that actually sets the right tone around the ethics and, and compliance, rather than the letter of the law, you must do X, Y, and Z. You know, I think the, uh, that was a good point. I think there needs to be a relevancy test, mm. right? And, and I, I keep going back to aerospace because that's my like, past life nightmare. <laughs> but aerospace is funny because what they do is, depending on how many souls are on the plane, how good the quality and how many backup systems you need. Because they look at how many people will be killed if this fails, right? If it's 747, four backups, right? If it's, if it's 30 people, two backups, right? So it's not a universal, uh, not a universal rule. They, they value judge how much effort to put into protection because of the number of souls lost. I think they ought to do that in uh, financial too. I go, you know, why, how, I mean, what's, what's the worst thing that's gonna happen? The second thing I wanted to comment on is Wells Fargo, right? We, in, our, in, in our shop, we, we call it, did it pass the stupid test, right? So you look at Wells Fargo, right? Took down the, the uh, CEO, right? So did anybody sit, when they were looking at all those accounts that were probably opened via compliance, box ticked, right? And they go, well, that's just great. We have so many accounts. In fact, we have four times the population of the U.S. in new accounts. Did anybody sit down and say, gee, that seems stupid. Something's <laughs> wrong with this number. Right? Nice. Uh, we're going to put it out to the audience for questions. So you're ahead of the curve again, sir, yeah, after sorry, doing reg tech I'm before the internet. I've got a, uh, a point I'd like to make, sure. rather unusually. A point I'd like to make, unusually enough for me, because I've never done it before, in defense of regulators, uh, but also because uh, uh, I'm always offended by the sun. <laughs> but I happened to hear a radio program where a health and safety executive official was on there talking about the Comca myth. And I can tell you that it is a myth. And I've got the HSE site, uh, website here, and it says, Myth, kids must wear goggles to play Conkers. It was a foolish head teacher who decided that, that was a good idea. It wasn't anything to do with the uh, regulator. And that's one of the problems actually regulators suffer from, mm. is that this kind of rubbish gets out there and this whole audience will go away <laughs> and repeat it and say, do you know what the regulator is doing? Massive round of applause for this man. <laughs> so, Thank you very I mean, much. A li little thing for me is, um, is, is the, to say the privacy, a li little bit for me about the, 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 how ridiculous it, it gets around some of the data privacy stuff. Like, you know, with kids you have to, sign waiver forms all the time and you can't take photos of kids at a, at a, at a concert or a, you know if your kids are performing the play you can't take photos or videos i mean that kind of stuff is just madness you know you, your kid is on the stage when you've got other kids there i know what you're going to say but but some i just like oh please you know we just I, it's got to an extent now around some of this stuff which is just when i was a kid it didn't matter and it's just gone to an extent now which is so ridiculous mm -hmm on some of this stuff that you you know you can't enjoy it you want to recall it for posterity that your son or daughter or whatever was doing a play mm. and you can't because you can't video it you know and it's madness mm. but i think actually you've touched on there one of the issues with compliance in that the reason you have written rules as opposed to go just purely by gut feel about what's okay or not is that actually people have very different views of what's acceptable no, uh, and so and so what's interesting, I think, is that the kids might feel differently. In fact, there was a child who recently sued her parents because they put all her childhood photos on the internet. Um, and I think she's a bit, she's a bit and they refused to take them down. She's like, I care for it because she was a younger generation. She's aware of the internet and her image and stuff. She wanted to control when, what went out there. Her parents had violated that right. She sued them. In France, it's now illegal to put pictures of your, of your own children or other people's children on the internet because the children don't, don't necessarily have a right. Now, now that might sound ridiculous, yep. but I think it's an attempt by the regulators to put a fra written framework. Now, it'll be tried and tested whether or not it's wor it works and whether it's worthwhile. But actually, when you ask a, a cross-section of an audience just on an ethical gut feel what they think is right and wrong, you'll always get variations. Mm -hmm. And I think where the law steps in is it does try to give some guidance there. So I would defend a little bit my fellow data privacy lawyers, but I do, you know, I do agree, but, it's but, annoying. It but, the but the point day. is, before this data privacy stuff came along, nobody ever thought about it. But it's a different environment. No, I know, but that's the point. <laughs> uh, you know, when you, when you were a kid, uh, your mum and dad never thought about it. It just happened. Yeah, so but I mean, you know, the, the other thing about Facebook is th there was that scandal recently with the paedophiles harvesting 
exactly those kinds of pictures off normal Facebook sites and, and using them. And I think, you know, I think that actually, if you're a slightly older generation like I am, you're not actually as aware of all the risks. And I think the same with financial services technologies. You know, it, it's very difficult actually across, increasingly difficult across generations to anticipate what the next serious risk will be. And I think the regulators do sometimes act a little bit overcautious, but, but it's because they're aware of that gap. Okay, um, good to have some different points. And a question from a new person in the audience. Welcome. Hello. Okay, um, speaking on age verification is actually a nightmare because every country keeps it differently. Uh, from taking yeah. child's fingerprints all the way through to age of passports and the rest of it. Um, to me, we've actually solved this problem, but we're trying to actually get, get the actual companies to understand it, which is, would you let your child do this? Which is the way we actually yeah. treat it. So actually, the parent takes responsibility for the child. And basically, if the parent can let the child do what they want, children are going to do what they want, even if you stop, stop them doing it. So basically, you provide a way of actually stopping them, and therefore, it becomes a regulated case of dealing with this. Because you can say, well, the parent takes responsibility for the child, which is how we used to have it. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the child can do as they wish to. And the parent says, no, stop. I don't, I don't believe the child should be doing this. And that's the way I suspect that's not how old laws used to work. And in some ways, the digital laws are actually behind this, because we're now putting in fixed laws saying, you can't do this at this age, you can't do this at that age. We've got a uh, working age verification in this work going on at the moment in the, in the, current, in the government under things like Verify. And it's, it's not solving the problem. We're actually going the wrong way in actually saying, you can't do this at this age. I mean, we should be saying, look, if the mother, if the mother or father says, I can't do this, the man over there says, if his child doesn't want to do this, if, I, if he doesn't want his child to do this, it's his choice to do that. Um, so it's interesting. We're coming into the issue of morals and ethics and whether they should be standardized or customized. And I imagine that's a bit of a problem because we have these guidances for everyone, which must include the, the most accident-prone, dumbest, foolhardy, hapless people, as well as people who don't suffer those problems. OK, um, let's go out to the audience. I'm going to try and prioritize people who haven't yet asked questions, because I think that's a fair way of doing it. Uh, so I think. Uh, yes, I'd, I'd like to ask, what is the most exciting great tech that you've seen <laughs> in the last 12 months and why? I'd like to answer that quickly because I went to a hackathon recently where a 15 year old kid made an open API that means if you sent your transactions through that, any small business could have AML done because small businesses can't keep track of AML guidelines. They don't have time, nowhere near enough time. You can employ 10 people and still not have enough time. But for little businesses, for one pound a month, you can pay that 15 year old and he updates the rules and regulations every month, so you don't need to care, but you've got, you can prove you're vetting it. Um, so there are seeds of some fantastic things that I've seen. That was a powerful one. Anyone here got some hot stories of uh, red tech companies blowing your mind? Uh, yeah, picking up on that, people like Passport doing something very similar, um, really finding economy in the onboarding KYC space. Um, and the client life cycle from a, an AML financial crime perspective, lots of the verification uh, solutions out there now, and people like Elliptic who are doing more around uh, a little bit like, uh, I think it was Alpesh or Gilbert uh, mentioned about uh, understanding transactions on Bitcoin and those sorts of things. So there's some cool stuff going on and tech can help. Cool. Into our last five minutes, um, so we'll speed it up and try and get in another question. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll quickly say that uh, obviously reg tech uh, companies include our smart privacy, which is our new offering. And that actually is interesting because it's an example of compliance being made available to a wider field of organizations because it's an automated compliance system. And I think that's an interesting space to watch, you know, where people can, can actually use automated off the shelf compliance checks and case management systems, which actually makes begins to make it affordable for startups in the same way uh, to have the same systems that big big technology companies have had. Yeah. Sorry, that was a plug. <laughs> yeah, okay. Sorry, we're going to carry on and all no, I, I mean, uh, well, it, it's, well, it's about that. It's, it's saying, what responsibility do you take for the quality of the service that's actually done? Well, I mean, that because we are technology, we've got a tech, technologists and we've got privacy practitioners who've been there for sort of, you know, we've got 20 years experience, we, we actually do take a degree of responsibility for the content of the system as opposed to just the technology. So we offer the expertise, like it's almost like a cheaper priced consultancy uh, with the technology. So we've sort of combined the two. 
I mean, this is the thing for me. That's what I want. You know, digital end-to-end -end model. I don't want armies of people. I want it to happen digitally and be compliant. I don't want to have. Exactly. You know, I want. I want it easy. Yeah. Want it, yeah. <laughs> but hey. So, cool. any examples? I think it's. I think. Unfortunately, I don't know. I don't, cool. Not something I can pay attention to, unfortunately. Which I should. There's two reg tech firms, uh, which I've seen this year. So one was the coin firm. So you know that's that's exciting because the major barrier between Bitcoin entering the mainstream is the fact you can't verify the identity of these people and what they've been doing. Uh, the other one is uh, social media due diligence, which at the moment doesn't quite meet the requirements because it's got to come from a, a public, you know, verifiable source. But it it it, it mines, you know, you log in with Facebook, say it mines the data in Facebook, works out. You know how many hours of your life you have wasted in Facebook, or, or you know you lived, um, and it works out you know, how many friends you have, and, and, and essentially it can work out that unless you're a really sad fraudster, there's no way you could possibly have set that up just to defraud someone because of the number of hours you've spent in it, the length of time it's required, the number of other genuine people who are also your friends or at least friends in Facebook. Cool. Letitia, want to mention any? Um, yes, actually. So I've seen a really good one called Two Lodge, which is second line of defense. Can and you, I mean, the spelling on that, so people can follow. So it's two oh. mics. <laughs> you two mics. There you go. So it's Two Lodge, two L O two L O D, which stands for second line of defense. Uh -huh. um, and Sorry, could you speak up, please? <laughs> so it's Two Lodge, two, and then L O D. Um, and the second one is actually from IBM. So IBM is starting uh, their own uh, fintech, regtech compliance yeah, hub as well. Yeah, what promontory, so. Yeah, exactly. Nice, so we have, at this moment, time for one more question. Um, we can have one more question and or, depending on how long the question and answers are, just a final thought from the panel. Um, if I can borrow one mic. Gary, Gary's been trying, Gary's been trying. <laughs> Gaz, yeah. Gaz. <laughs> it's a sort of question. I'm working now mainly in the cybersecurity business, having been around financial crime for quite a long time. And I'm dealing a lot with the maritime industry. And the International Maritime Organization, which is the global regulator, part of the UN, for this industry, is now talking about creating regulations for cybersecurity. There's a, a major problem here which exemplifies a, a bigger problem in regulation, that the, the risk you're regulating against are moving that much faster than the ability of the regulator to move. And this is particularly true because it's an international organization with 130 or national members who have to achieve consensus. It's rather like anti-money law in this respect. So how do you deal with a, with a situation where actually the regulators are going to be regulating against not just yesterday's problem, but last decade's problem. There's a stunned look on the panel there. None of you are grabbing the microphone off me. Yeah, I, I, again, I'm going to bang on about it again. It's about that risk focus, right? There is the, the only way to keep abreast of develops, developments in digital crime, cyber crime, is to be constantly horizon scanning, looking at how the risks are developing and then moving forward. As far as learning from history, yeah, you've got to learn from history, but equally you've got to look forward and actually that's more important. Cool. So we can also wrap into this. This is final moments. If you've got like three words that you think you want to be remembered for tonight, now's your opportunity and then we have to wrap up. Yeah, compliance isn't bad. It adds value to your business. Get it right, and you'll uh, you won't have any problems. Cool. Keep a philosophical uh, focus and a customer service focus. And if your client or customer found out what you're doing, would they be happy or not? I would say don't be afraid of the cost of compliance. Look at what's out there, which is free, new ways of technology, new technologies that are developing to make it easier for you to comply and keep an eye on those developments as much as the developments in the law. Uh, I'd say engage at an early stage. Invest the time to make sure you understand it and give proper due consideration. So engagement, understanding, and then execution. I would say embed 
because it's really important to get your people to understand compliance because they do they make the decisions every day that affect customers um, so you really have to make sure they understand what they're doing and how it impacts their jobs and what they need to do I mean, me it's very simple give me digital compliance <laughs> that's it give me digital compliance that's what I want okay. make it easy for me to do this and cheaply <laughs> You, we would let you sing if you wanted to. Oh. <laughs> Maybe that's no, a title no. for a song. <laughs> no, too Keep bad. Not this bad. Um, so that's it, thanks. Uh, if everyone, we could have a final round of applause to our expert panel. <laughs>